I'd now like to introduce our panelists, starting on my immediate left. We have Lynn Redmond here with us from Noble Grape and Brew HQ. Lynn is the e-commerce and marketing manager for Noble Grape and Brew HQ, which is a new e-commerce store for home brewers. Marketing a rapidly growing business, coupled with 14 years of agency experience, has contributed to Lynn's diverse skill set, which includes e-commerce and content strategy, social media and online marketing, and user experience and creative direction for the web. Beside Lynn is Aaron Whitman from AbleSense Media. Aaron is the president of AbleSense, and he draws upon 19 years of experience in e-commerce and website development to help clients of all sizes succeed online. He has a devoted interest in working with merchants to grow their businesses and providing them with the tools that they need to move the needle. A strategist and problem solver by nature, Aaron supports the AbleSense team to deliver exceptional work on strategy, content, creative, and mobile-first responsive design. And last but not least, we have Alex McCann. Alex is the CEO of Bay Run Pet Products, and she brings over 15 years of experience in international business, including export finance, project finance, debt restructuring, and international trade and investment. I should mention that Alex is also the Chief Operating Officer of Dockside Investco Incorporated. She has most recently uh, served as Lead Investment Attraction Executive for the Agri-Food, Seafood, and Bioresources Portfolio at Nova Scotia Business Inc. Prior to that, she held several positions at the Export-Import Bank of the United States. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, how we're going to run our session today is I'm going to pose some questions to our panel. And closer to the end of the session, we should have some time for some questions from the audience. So let's start with Aaron. Uh, Aaron, if you could tell us what we mean when we say e-commerce, and maybe talk a bit about what businesses should consider exploring e-commerce. Sure. OK, thanks, Beth. Um, I think e-commerce um, means selling online, but that means a, something different today, perhaps, than it meant in 1999, when, when you probably first bought your first uh, product or service online. So it's, it's sort of a, a drifting term around the way people use the internet broadly, and there's apps on devices that are in our pockets that nobody um, realistically envisioned, perhaps, uh, 20 years ago. And there's contexts that come with that, where people are engaging with brands, talking to their friends or network about products and services. And these are places where shopping opportunities happen and customer service and customer experience can happen. So I think today what e-commerce means is uh, addressing that marketplace, um, wherever it may be. And that market could be consumers, it could be B2B. Uh, it can be international markets. And it's essentially, if you're not doing e-commerce um, in these places, you're, you're sort of missing out on a large segment of, of commerce overall. So we will oftentimes drop the E prefix when we're talking about it within industry uh, sessions. I don't know if, if the world is re really ready for us to drop the E off of e-commerce, but the reality is it's becoming more central. And, and you see this with consumer brands. Uh, and also in, uh, in places where people are selling business to business as well. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of the nature of it uh, as it stands today. Great. Uh, now a question for our companies. What is the biggest hurdle to getting started? And did you have any concerns before launching your e-commerce side of your business? So this question, I've been thinking about it. And I, what, what I've come up with is, I can tell you what wasn't a hurdle. <laughs> sure. Um, I think a lot of people are intimidated by the actual building of the e-commerce website or having a presence online. Um, but that really is the part that is, is manageable. Um, you've probably built websites for your company already, whether, whether or not you sell on them. So you already know how to do that. And you can. there's experts and there's advice and tools available to sort of get you up and running. Um, so if you think that that's the hurdle, it's a lot of work, don't get me wrong, but it, it's not a hurdle. The, the things that you have to consider outside of that 
are what happens once you launch it? How, how do you keep the customer experience from I have a really great website through to the person opening up their package when they get it? So if you think making the website's the hurdle, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Anything to add, Alex? Uh, yeah, I would say um, for so just a, a little bit of background about uh, Bay Run, because we're a relatively new company. We are a, a company that makes pet supplements. So they're um, small items that are very easily sold online. So the online platform is a, is a, for e-commerce is, is a great platform for us. And we had kind of a vision that we would uh, leverage that um, e-commerce space because it hadn't been previously uh, done for, uh, for our company. Um, but one of the, I, I'd probably say that one of the biggest challenges for us uh, was more of an internal challenge as opposed to an external challenge. Uh, a lot of the challenge, part of our vision was that we're a small company and we really need to leverage um, platforms that are available such as Shopify uh, to kind of maximize our uh, capacity internally um, as well as being able to uh, reach our customers. Um, but one of our biggest challenges actually came from our finance department, from our finance team. Um, not totally understanding how the Shopify e-commerce uh, platform was actually going to benefit us. Um, with Shopify, you get a lot of support in terms of um, um, knowing what kind of taxes to, to uh, uh, apply to your products by jurisdiction, and especially if you're exporting to the U.S., um, it helps you with tax calculations and things like that into different markets, which was a, a key selling feature to us. Uh, but we did have some people that are in our finance department, which uh, were not that excited about um, e-commerce, were very nervous about what the tax implications would be. Uh, and uh, from a regulatory standpoint, so getting them comfortable with the idea that we could use a uh, e-commerce platform to sell within Canada and then also export to another market um, took some took some work actually to get them on board. So um, a little a little bit of a, a slightly different challenge. That's a great point, though. How important it is that everyone in the business is on side. So yeah. thank you. Um, let's take it back to Aaron. Aaron, how does a business know if a new sales channel is a good fit for them? Uh, th there's traditional things you can do. You can you can do competitive research. Is it working for others or, or like products? Um, but the reality is, in in some cases, it might be uncharted territory. And the good news, I guess, about that is um, the tooling today is is plentiful. So there, there's many e-commerce platforms that are straightforward to use if you if you've got expert advice. Um, there's marketing and uh, sales channels tools that connect these things as well. So the, the technology aspect of it, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's relatively a solved problem in a, in a variety of ways. So you can put yourself into a, a channel relatively straightforward, a definable project. Whether it's a good fit or not gets into all kinds of competitive features. Is there margin still there? Uh, what's the benefit of being in the channel? In some cases, you know, we've seen merchants who um, who maybe are well established in retail channels? Maybe they're they're selling in Walmart or they're 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 on Amazon already. The direct to consumer channel gets added, and there might be a finance conversation around. Mm -hmm. Well, how much is this even worth to us? And in those cases, sometimes they're using that channel um, as a marketing initiative, independent of you know what fraction of total total uh, revenue it creates. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea is get into these channels and find out what they're doing through measurement. They're, that we're in the middle of the GDPR. Um, raise their hands if you've heard of GDPR. Know what it means? Yeah. Do you know what it means? <laughs> That's a whole other, yeah. <laughs> so the idea of measuring and tracking and understanding what customers are doing uh, through the electronic systems you put forth to the world. Uh, GDPR is a uh, EU law that's come into effect, I believe, on May 25th, um, that forces businesses of all kinds to uh, have a purpose for the data we collect about people and communicate clearly to them what we're using it for and also let them know what we've got about them and l allow them to purge it if we don't need it for a legitimate business reason. There's a lot more to it and I'm not a lawyer, but so, so with that preface, I would say measuring what's going on in a channel is really straightforward. There's tons of technology that lets you understand what your customers are doing. You can segment your, your sales data based on channel. And you can run little experiments if you if you set yourself up with a good e-commerce platform. Um, 
Shopify, Magento, Big Commerce, uh, eBay selling, Amazon, whatever it is, you can connect that into different markets and different territories. You can test market your promotions, and you can do minimum dose experiments with the machine you've already built. So what we would say is let's you know let's let problems or channels fight their way in. Let's make sure we're doing them because we we feel like we can't ignore them. And once we're in them, let's have our eyes wide open, no preconceptions. How do we measure the effectiveness of it? So then six months in, you'll know if it's a good fit. Great. It's a roundabout answer, but good. Thank you. Um, Lynn and Alex, how did your businesses manage the increased production that can be associated with an e-commerce strategy? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I would say initially not very well. Um, so we, we had a recent um, uh, case where we had uh, a bit of a disconnect between our marketing team and our production team. Uh, where the marketing team wanted to um, put out um, um, an awareness campaign to, to sell a particular uh, product, which is called uh, Diatomaceous Earth. And so uh, we had a huge social media you know, blast and got everything out, and they were putting out all kinds of information and tweeting and Instagramming and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, and there was a bit of a mismatch with the production, because clearly if you're promoting one particular product, you need to have that product in stock. Um, and then on our website, because we hadn't um, gotten enough product in stock, then all of a sudden it showed up as out of stock. <laughs> so uh, we basically ran out of stock on, on, a, on a product. It um, got a lot of traction online, but we, had a, we just had to disconnect in, in production. So I had to go back to the marketing team, and it was like, OK, we cannot start marketing anything until we have verified that we have in, inventory in stock. So I, I think that's kind of a, a, a common um, a, a, problem that many businesses face. Um, I think online, yeah, the, the issue becomes more that it's more visible. Um, so your customers that are coming, that you're attracting, come to your website, and it either looks like you're doing gangbusters, great business, and they just can't get this hot product, or it's very annoying, and they get ticked off, and then they go somewhere else. Um, so that was one challenge we had uh, in terms of um, uh, ma managing a challenge of uh, production with them. Um, increased visibility online. Um, I would say that's probably one of the main uh, things. I, also, our, uh, one of our manufacturers that we have, uh, we have two manufacturers for our products, um, getting them up and running because they had not previously done a lot of uh, e-commerce um, selling. So uh, getting the units for a direct-to-consumer as opposed to a direct-to-retailer or a direct-to-distributor um, uh, and matching those things up can sometimes be a challenge. Thank you. Lynn, would you like to add anything? Yeah, sure. Um, so with the Noble Grape, they had already turned on a Shopify store. They didn't promote it at all. They were unbeknownst to themselves selling stuff. And then so they hired me <laughs> to, <laughs> to grow it. Um, and being a, you might not think of it as this, but we still think of ourselves as a small business. And being a small grassroots business who've been bootstrapping for well, now 25 years, so it's, it's a long time. But <laughs> when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're working in a family-run business, it's like everyone really feels like they're all in this together. Um, so when, when that site started to grow, um, and as has been happening in the past, they would always just sort of throw something at the wall. And if it worked, then they would react. Mm. So when we were getting uh, ready to launch our new Brew HQ site, or when we started talking about if we're going to sell beer supplies to people, we should be called a beer name and not a wine name. It'll mm. save us marketing money. And we're like, yeah, great idea. So then I sat down six months before before we even met with AbleSense to talk to them about if then what. So if we make when we launch, when we make this much money, then what do we do instead of everyone being run off their feet and working overtime and, and trying to push this out, just having a plan in place of steps. Like, we can build the website and build the brand, but then we need to hire someone to actually run this store. And then we launch. And then once that happens, once we get to a certain amount per month, then we need to hire more people in the warehouse to take care of fulfillment. So just have a plan ready to know when you're going to need something before you actually need it. Of course, I'm not going to hire five people for a store that's not launched yet, but I know I'm probably going to have to within the next two years. So just like sort of keep that in mind and plan it into your budgets and your schedules. Great point. Thank you. 
Um, maybe we could talk a little bit more about fulfillment and you could share your experience. Um, and Aaron, maybe you could weigh in as well uh, about the different options, whether fulfillment is managed internally, whether businesses use a drop ship method, or even a third party logistics provider. Uh, all of the above. Um, you probably re recall the story of uh, Jeff Bezos when he started Amazon. He would take each book himself and put a label on it and walk it to the post office. So you can start there. Um, so the, the ramp up from there is, uh, you know, getting a warehouse, fulfilling it yourselves um, with a team, outsourcing it to a third party uh, logistics company that can help you in different markets or territories. So geogra you want to be shipping in close proximity to where your customers are to keep shipping costs down. Uh, and then ultimately you can do a fully integrated rollout. Um, Amazon's not the only company in the world that does that. They're just sort of the largest example where you've got your own distributed warehousing system as well. So all of it uh, works. And one thing that, that we've seen uh, that's really interesting around uh, businesses who are, who are bricks and mortar, who want to add e-commerce as a channel, uh, this is a this is an interesting challenge for them as well, because they they understand how to do merchandising and uh, inventory management for the retail space. A lot of the the same things you have to do online. You you essentially have to do merchandising online, and you have to figure out okay, what's the workflow? Do we prioritize web orders for expediency, or do we prioritize keeping that shelf full of product and faced all the time? So there's a lot of nuances depending on the kind of business, but uh, you can you can start by literally walking it to the post office and go from there. Um, there's, there's services that will help you put product in warehouses in other parts of the world, and they will automatically fulfill for you based on e-commerce orders. And there's all stops in between. Great. Lynn or Alex, would you like to add anything? Well, I'll just add that I was very lucky to come into a place that already had a warehousing system in place to supply their bricks and mortar store. So. Had that not been the case, fulfillment and shipping would have, uh, I, I think, would have bubbled to the top for me. Uh, because like I said previously, having someone have a great experience on your website and ordering something, if it takes too long, if it shows up damaged, if, if it's costing you too, more to send it than, it than what your margins are, um, these are all really important things. So like Aaron said, there's everything from walk it to the post office yourself, which I've seen people do. I'm going to start selling t-shirts and I'm going to bring these to the post office up to we already have a warehouse and we already have systems and couriers in place. Just make sure you don't aim too high. Like keep it in what, what's, what you're able to accomplish when you first start out uh, because you don't want to spend too much, have it take up too much time or give your customers a bad experience. Great, thank you. Uh, I think for, for us, we have a, a, a bit of a more complicated um, uh, situation from a warehousing, logistics, and fulfillment um, situation. We have some of our products, which are manufactured here in, uh, in Dartmouth, and they go to our warehouse, which is in Guelph. Uh, we're a bit lucky because our um, warehouse mm -hmm. and uh, 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 fulfillment uh, service is also a, re a related company to us, who also, uh, conveniently enough, also uh, uses a Shopify uh, website as well. So we've been able to um, use the tool to communicate uh, directly with our warehouse around our uh, order and fulfillment needs um, and um, get that in place. But it, is, uh, it, it does become a bit um, complicated when you have multiple different parties uh, working together. Uh, one of the things that I find really great about um, our e-commerce platform is that it allows us to see all of our inventory. We can track where it is. We can bring it into the system. I can. Um, uh, uh, do do checks on a weekly basis. I can send um, messages directly to the warehouse for them to fulfill an order, communicate directly with the customer to tell them that the order is coming. And all of this stuff is, is mostly automated, which for a very small company is priceless because I don't have enough bodies around to do all of the work that can be done uh, through the e-commerce platform. It also is a great place to warehouse um, tracking of just information. Uh, so I can see how long it took for an order to get fulfilled or if a, a piece of something was not able to, to be shipped out. It's also great because I can um, uh, uh, manage um, some of the uh, logistics and shipping costs as well and get quotes on that. Uh, we're also shipping to the U.S., so that adds an additional element of uh, logistics um, and um, export uh, issues. 
related to uh, to fulfillment. So there's all kinds of export related documents depending on the products that you have. So we also have our customs broker uh, sort of tied up in all of our fulfillment requirements as well. So um, yeah, it's a little, it, but I, it's it's super helpful to have the e-commerce platform. Thank you. Um, Aaron, maybe you can tell us a bit about the key elements that a business should consider when developing and rolling out an e-commerce strategy. I think the most important thing is to take it seriously and um, don't, uh, don't take the position that we're going to dabble in this and see if there's traction. Uh, that, that's like scratch tickets. Um, that you'll hear of one or two people who did that, turn it on, and things went great. And yes, that does happen to some people. It will probably never be you. Uh, you need some kind of a plan for that to happen. And uh, what we like to say is you know, try to pull this into the center of your business a little bit more. Um, if you've got a 25 or 50-year-old company with a huge brand awareness and lots of traction, that sounds like hyperbole, putting e-commerce at the center of your, of your business that's already working. Uh, but the truth is, uh, customers are in places that you're not right now, and they might very well uh, move the needle in your business if you can serve them well. So I think the most important thing is don't take the dabbler approach. Um, if you're small and, and, and it's sort of like we don't know what this means, we've got a store and we'd like to give it a try, absolutely. The tooling's never been easier. You can launch your own store in an afternoon. You really can. Um, it's unlikely to be a huge contributor at first, though. If you're a larger business and you're looking at, you've never done e-commerce before, or perhaps you're a B2B and, and you've never done direct-to-consumer B2C, these are things that you can make solid plans for, um, do relatively straightforward implementations. We're talking months to, to give yourself a chance to try that. But if you don't, if you're not ready to, you know, staff up the way Lynn talked about in her business where you know you're going to need to increase customer support. Mm -hmm. Uh, if people are on your website, you want them to feel like they're in the right place and they know what to do next. And so a lot of that comes down to you see live chat is a major feature now where card abandonment is a metric. You'll start If you're doing e-commerce already, you'll know card abandonment is a big metric. You see what's causing people to bail out. So you're going to have to take steps to correct those, those, those uh, realities once you're measuring and, and you're selling online. And you can't just say, oh, well, it looks like everyone leaves the shopping cart when the shipping's calculated. I guess e-commerce didn't work for us. It's going to work. It's working for lots of people. And so I think you have to have a commitment to, um, to a plan. And, and you know, we, we often talk about it as like, um, in our at Able Sense, we're sort of like personal trainers for your e-commerce or your website, where we want you to do your, your push-ups, and we want you to floss your teeth, and we want to make sure you do that every day to stick to the program. And I think you need a commitment, whether it's minimum dose getting started or whether it's scaling, a commitment to the plan is, I think, the most important piece. And Aaron, how important is a digital marketing strategy to e-commerce? And maybe you can talk a little yeah. bit about paid versus organic. Yeah, it, it's huge. Um, this is a new frontier competition. So once you're selling online and your competitors are there, they're viciously uh, trying to outbid you for, for paid marketing. And you need to make sure that you're not paying too much for that. So you want to find a strategy where you can essentially uh, get ROI in your ad spend. You know, people will talk about um, conversion rate, and that's a it's a fun metric. It's often misleading. We can usually drive conversion rate up by just reducing the number of people at the top of your funnel. So we can make it look, oh, conversion rate's gone up. What a great website we made. Um, maybe, um, hopefully. But the other side of it is, what is your actual cost of sales through online? So. Uh, you've got an ad spend. Um, is that is that um, augmented by the fact that you're you're doing a great job with organic as well, so that your overall cost per sale uh, is lower than your competitors? And if you're buying ads in Google or Facebook or places like that, those kind of ad marketplaces, it's highly competitive. Um, does anybody sell golf equipment? <laughs> Try to buy the word golf on Google AdWords. It's it's not available at a price you want. Right, so there's little, there's a lot of uh, strategy around what are we going to do for promotion and, and basically filling the top of the funnel with people who are likely to be our customers. I think the biggest untapped resource, and because we're all annoyed by it as consumers, is uh, permission-based email marketing. We all get our inboxes full of promotional emails all the time. It drives us nuts. We delete them. We don't always unsubscribe though, and I think that's what's important to recognize is 
if you've got a loyal fan base and customers who tell their friends and they've given you permission to email them about products and services or even subscriptions, uh, that is the low-hanging fruit. And it may feel awkward because we don't like getting all those emails personally. But what we'll say is make your emails the ones that don't get unsubscribed from. Let everybody else's get unsubscribed. And I think that's a huge untapped piece. The other thing we can do with that is personalization now, where you're not just putting the same ad out to everybody um, on an ad network. With e-commerce data, you can start to personalize those ads or even those emails based on not just an individual's uh, purchase history, but what other people like them are more likely to buy. So I think having a, a strategy on how you're going to get really good at one tactic, figure out how it works, and move to the next is, is critical. And it's also going to help you plan your staffing growth. Sometimes I feel like the world is getting to a place where I think about a product or service I'm interested in, and it pops up on my Facebook ad, and <laughs> I get an yeah. email about it. So um, is there anything you'd like to add, Lynn or Alex, about your uh, digital marketing strategies? Well, uh, our, uh, luckily enough for us, we've actually turned to AbleSense for some help on the um, digital marketing strategy. So we have a, a team that's, uh, that's working with us and uh, also some of our other companies. So uh, Bay Run is uh, one company that's in a portfolio of other related companies uh, that are all in the, in the pet space. So we have a uh, master service agreement with, uh, with AbleSense to, um, to, to work on some of the digital strategy work for uh, many of the companies that are, that are there, including, uh, including Bay Run. Um, but we're sort of gone through, um, uh, you know, looking at what the, the, the look and the feel of our, everything from our language, how, you know, who's our customer, how we're communicating to them, are we a serious company, are we fun and playful? You know what things look like. What's the best uh, way to reach the customer? What um, are the things that they're responsive to? Whether it's a coupons or a daily or a monthly subscription for, in this case, pet supplements. Um, and so, uh, so we're we're sort of at the um, beginning of uh, doing that right now. So it ha it's uh, beginning to uh, to be rolled out for us. Thank you. My advice would be, before you do your strategy, turn on Google Merchant Center for Google Shopping ads if you sell a product. You should just do that. That's the lowest hanging fruit. If someone types in, product I'm looking for, and you sell that product, you will come up with the price and your company name. Someone can click it and buy it. I, When I first started at Noble Grave, as I mentioned, they already had some a catalog available online. I turned that on in sales, and that's pretty much all I did at first, because then we sort of started on this path of rebranding as a beer brand, and there's everything else that has to get done as well. Um, sales increased by 200%, just from turning on $500 a month on Google Merchant Center shopping ads. So Great. do that, and then plan your strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Aaron, you in particular have hinted a bit about tools that are available to help companies with the performance management for their e-commerce initiatives. Uh, how important are those tools? And maybe if everybody could talk a little bit about tools that they're using on performance management. Well, I think that's sort of the promise of, of <laughs> e-commerce and digital marketing in general is that you can measure it. Mm -hmm. So you can understand what tactics you're taking, what money you're spending, what it's doing for you. So um, Google Analytics is a, is a popular one. It's probably the most popular sort of uh, measuring what's happening on site, letting you segment the activity on your site by where people came from. That fits into a constellation of all kinds of things. So every, every platform that people look at their phones and, and spend time on has some kind of analytics package that's, that's native to that. So you'll get reports from Facebook, from, from even Twitter, if you're doing Twitter ads, and those sorts of things. Um, you have to take it seriously. I, you know, there's a lot of vanity metrics is a, is a term you, might, you may have heard of where our likes are way up. Or that, and so unless you know the reason why you care about that and you, you really understand it, um, you should probably be questioning it. Um, you don't want to have sort of a vanity metric dashboard that's, that's driving your, your thought process every week. What you really want to understand is, um, are there problems that we can address to improve a bottleneck or, or a gap in, in the flow here? Are we, are we getting not enough people here? OK, what can, we, what can we correct to improve that? Once they arrive in whatever channel it is, uh, are they behaving the way we would have expected them to when we set this up? Are they discovering products in the fewest uh, number of steps? Um, is there a frictionless checkout? And that's a thing where the tooling really helps. So 
you know, we're, we're a Shopify partner agency, so we, we probably know that better than any platform. Um, some of the things that they have put forth on, on, uh, in their checkout flow have been really interesting, where based on the location of the customer and the device they're on, they will float up the most appropriate payment method. So if you're on an iOS device and you're in North America or Europe, the first payment method you're probably going to see is Apple Pay. Um, if you're in Germany, they have a, a gateway that I can't remember the name of that everybody uses that no one over here even uses. That one sort of comes to the top. If you're on an Android device, um, Google Checkout will be there. So the reason they're doing that is they've got data on 700,000 plus stores. They know where people are falling out of the, the flow. And they've made UI decisions around, let's simplify this to reduce friction. So as, as a web designer since you know, 1999, uh, these are problems we were trying to do in, in one-offs or across maybe an industry category. Google Analytics will give you sector-specific stuff you can opt into to find out how your peers are also are handling certain metrics. But when you're at the scale of a big platform like, like Amazon or eBay or Shopify is getting there and, and others, they're fine-tuning the platform based on everybody's data, not just yours. And those are things I think that are, that are you know, you can see the scale they're doing that at. And personally, you can test messaging. So maybe segment your audience and go, let's try uh, a message with a certain tone, and let's try it with a different tone elsewhere. Let's measure which one is broadly known as like A-B testing. Uh, these are tools available to you. They're relatively affordable. They're built into a lot of the platforms. And uh, it's important to have a plan for how you're going to use them. You should have an expected outcome when you roll these out. And you shouldn't just turn on all the things, because then you don't necessarily know what is moving the needle. Great, thank you. Alex and Lynn, did you want to talk a bit about performance measure tools that you're using? Um, well, through Shopify, we get uh, a, a whole host of uh, tools. I mean, I can check you know, sales minute to minute and uh, check the inventory levels and things like that. Uh, we also have other tools, uh, kind of what uh, Aaron mentioned, where you know, you, we can check uh, our conversions from Facebook or Instagram to see how um, he, to see how our marketing or social social media marketing uh, is is doing, um, and you can get oh, it's it's pretty fascinating. You can get data on like where a person is. I mean, they don't necessarily identify the person, but they'll say somebody in Washington State that was using Twitter looked at your page. They were on there for 1.5 seconds. They spent 10 seconds on this page, and I mean, it's it's really quite fascinating. Um, and it's helpful, and we flip that information back to our uh, marketing department to let them know. Uh, one, like I said, we had uh, the, the campaign where we had kind of launched a campaign but didn't have the product, and you know you can see the uptake of people going to it, and then obviously there's you know card abandonment because we don't have any inventory. We actually had inventory, it just wasn't registered on the website. So. Anyway, <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, they were like, nobody's buying stuff, and I was like, well, that's weird because we have like all this inventory. How come no one's? It's like, oh, nobody changed the inventory numbers on the website, so it looks like there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the the analytics are. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that you can measure, but I think kind of to to Aaron's point, you have to know why you're why you're using those particular tools or what your your strategy is or um, who you, who your target market is. Um, I think for us in the, the pet space, kind of we've uh, identified our, our target ma uh, uh, market um, or is uh, you know millennials of a certain age or um, older people, uh, b boomers who uh, ki whose kids have gone away. So we can get a lot of data uh, back to see are we hitting that group? Are we are we showing them the content that they're really interested in, uh, and giving them the visuals or the images or selling them the products that they're that they're actually interested in? So we can tweak. Um, and it's pretty, you, you, can, you can do it quite quickly because you have access to the platform. If you see something that's really taking off, you can either tweak something almost instantaneously or offer a coupon kind of on the spot um, to be a little bit more reactive and push traffic kind of almost instantaneously. So I think it's pretty yeah, interesting. It's yeah. Um, just in addition to that, every single platform you use, every single mm -hmm. social media channel you're on, every website it's it they're all about data now and and you there you can find out and receive in so much information about what's happening um, so I think you really like getting the data is not the problem I think what you really need to do is figure out what what are the data points that are 
of most interest to you and why, and also not sort of get caught up in percentages. Um, so f for email lists, for example, if you send out an email to 500 people, it gets a 45% open rate, and you're like, yeah. And then if your email list grows to 3,000 people, your open rate might go down to 30, 35%, which is still an excellent open rate, but like so many more people have put their eyes on that email. So don't feel like things are getting worse when they're actually getting better because you can sort of find whatever you want in the numbers. So just, just make sure to see the forest for the trees. Is that the saying? <laughs> Great point. Can I add to that yes. too? Uh, marketing intelligence and analytics is, is important. And the other piece that, that doesn't get talked about perhaps enough is customer support metrics. Mm. How many touches before you resolve an issue? That's, that's not a vanity metric. That's an important one that should be front of mind. Can you resolve it in the first touch? Um, that's, that's something that's built into pretty much every support ticketing system. Um, also, uh, cart abandonment and cart recovery, that's becoming more popular where uh, a customer's on the site, they, they probably want to buy, but for some reason they bail out. And the industry at large is, is sort of working on tactics for how to do that. There's these automatic, hey, you forgot to finish buying, and you might say, well, I meant to, f f to not buy. Uh, but sometimes there's this uncertainty. So things like having an immediate follow-up with that customer to find out, was it really we just didn't communicate properly to them, or really they were just window shopping. Those are things that we're going to start to to be able to capture as, as business metrics. And um, it's equally as important, I think, as where your marketing spend's going and what marketing channels. Good point. Thank you. Um, we're definitely living in a world of data breaches and privacy concerns. Uh, maybe we could all talk for a few minutes about how you're managing these security risks in your businesses, uh, whether or not you use a third-party service provider. I honestly really have to rely on the research I've done to use the correct platforms to, to make sure that I'm not a security expert. I don't have time to be a security expert, nor do I probably want to be. I don't know. Maybe it's great. But um, you just you, you really have to make sure that the, the third parties that you work with are, ha are the ones that are responsible for that in some way. Um, because as a small business who sells products, like security expertise is probably not on your list of many things you have to do in the day. Um, so you just have to really do your research and, and make sure that, that the apps are... Um, platforms that you're that you're working with have their own built-in security measures. Uh, this is a topic for an entire. It could two, be a whole session. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> the internet's a big and scary place. Uh, the world's a big and scary place. The the platform providers have the best people in the world, making sure that their platforms don't get compromised because they've got more to lose than any one merchant does. So whether it's Google or Amazon or Shopify or whoever. Uh, having said that, they're also big targets because they're big organizations with all kinds of data. So the reality is you have to trust in that they're working hard to, to fight off the bad guys. Uh, but there's all kinds of steps you can take and, and to make yourself more secure. Strong passwords um, is a big deal. So if you're not using strong passwords or enforcing strong passwords for people who log in, um, Stop that. Do it today. S switch to strong passwords. That's literally within your control. And uh, enforcing strong passwords, if you've got a B2B e-commerce portal, don't let your, your merchants have weak passwords. Um, uh, just make sure that, uh, that that's secure so that essentially they're not getting compromised. Uh, so th there, there's a thing you can just take. Um, the other thing to look out for is uh, whenever you're adding software to your, your constellation of, of what it is that you're your operations is. So maybe you've got Shopify as your main uh, e-commerce channel, but you're also selling in the Amazon and eBay sales channels. Um, and maybe you've also got some kind of app uh, that lets people buy directly from their phone that's different than your website. You want to be working with app vendors who, who talk about how they're PCI compliant, which is sort of a, a process for um, ensuring that checkout data and credit card data is handled appropriately and, and uh, managed safely and securely. So you'll see anyone who's good at that, they will mention it in, in their terms of service and also their, their, their features that their platform uh, addresses that. Uh, the, the GDPR, uh, the, the General Data Process Protection? Protection. Protection. 
are requirement. Requirements. requirements. Yeah. I just made that it's up. a good guess. It's, it's <laughs> an EU thing that uh, our government in Canada didn't sort of tell us to do, but we all have to do, and the world has to do. And what's happening is most platforms are just painting the world with, with one big GDPR brush now, saying, if we've got to do it for Europeans, we're doing it for everybody because it, it's too difficult. So um, what, what we found is uh, when, you, when you're a partner with Shopify, like I said, it's an 800-pound gorilla sometimes, when they decide they're going this way around uh, that kind of GDPR compliance, we all have to jump and, and act accordingly. So these are things that are a reality of being online. Uh, we've, we also have a couple of apps in Shopify's App Store. So those are vetted, and we're one of, of thousands of firms who, who have apps there that extend the functionality of Shopify. So that's a little bit different than if we made an open source plugin and we sort of put it out on the website, hey, anyone can, and can go use this. We're vetted by Shopify, so all the apps are, and for performance, security, and a number of things. But also, when they say, great, GDPR is a reality for us now, if a European asks a Shopify merchant to show what information they've got or to purge it, we all now have to respond to that, too. And that just unfolded after the May 25th deadline, by the way. So these are, these are realities of, of dealing with privacy and security on the web. And it's not going to change. It's just, it's like the rain. You know, sometimes it rains and you, you get an umbrella and you go to work anyway. Um, the, the idea is you can't do it all. Um, and big firms like Google and Amazon and, and Shopify, they've got some of the best people in the world working on this. So that's, that's a sort of a, a tick on a box of whether you should host your own and do your own or, or go with one of these other platform providers. Good points. Thank you. Alex, anything you'd like to add about your company's experience? Um, not anything too too significant. I think we kind of uh, realized when we we sell um, direct to retailers, consumers, uh, and distributors, um, and oftentimes we had we had a, a, a new customer uh, form uh, account form that we'd have them fill out, uh, which would ask for credit card information, and we were collecting that. And then at some point we realized, oh, this is not that secure um, because now we're holding these people's credit card information and anybody could you know get access to the their files or things like that so we put the gabosh on that um, on that uh, process um, and really one of the things that we're, we've been doing and trying to do with our uh, um, e-commerce site is really to get our retailers and distributors to set up accounts with us uh, through our e-commerce site so that they can order directly themselves all of the products and things that they want with their distributor or retail uh, pricing. Uh, that allows them to control their own account, put their own credit card information, um, and also you know, lessens the, the touch points in terms of uh, uh, the amount of customer service that we have to provide unless there's a, an issue. Um, and it uh, keeps things a lot more, a lot more secure. So, um, so that's a change we've made in the last, uh, probably last month. So yeah. Great, thank you. Um, we've talked a little bit about tools that are available to help businesses manage their e-commerce platforms, but Aaron, maybe you could lead us off and talk a little bit about what services are available to support the rollout of an e-commerce platform for businesses here in Nova Scotia. Well, there, there's a number of professional services agencies who build and, and support e-commerce launches. That, that's not necessarily a new thing. Um, platform expertise is a reality, so um, there's enough differences between going with, with one platform or the next that might help you select an implementation partner who can help you avoid pitfalls. So if you were going to be working with Magento and we couldn't talk you out of that to work with Shopify, we would not work <laughs> with you. Um, that's not our forte. Um, th those are, those are um, the kind of things you want to make sure you've got someone who isn't just maybe good at making websites, but knows where some of the edges are and the pitfalls are with a particular mm -hmm. platform. And the good news is the, the world is a small place now, and there are experts everywhere. If you can't find somebody in your backyard, there is probably someone who's happy to work uh, for you remotely as well. And uh, so, so that, that there are people who understand that their expertise can help businesses sell online, and they're happy to do consulting engagements there. The other part is the platforms themselves have a ton of support now. So um, I can speak mostly about Shopify, but I know that uh, Amazon offers huge amounts of seller support, eBay to some extent, um, Google Shopping has a fair amount. Shopify has almost like training and academy stuff you can go through. So, so you want to start from zero or you're already an established business and you want a, a sector specific or industry specific 
a uh, bit of know-how. They're providing that information, and it's based on uh, what they're seeing happen with their, their, their installed base, their merchants. So those things just sort of come with. Um, and then what we've found, too, is there's a lot of support um, in Nova Scotia in particular around export, not just from NSBI connecting and helping people, but um, you'll, you'll see it from Seed is a great organization um, that, that's helping a lot of entrepreneurs figure out how to sell online. Um, and it goes up from there. ACOA, I think, um, I think there's even agencies Learnsphere. broadly, I'm thinking LearnSphere mm -hmm. yeah, in New Brunswick, right? Where they're able to, uh, to assist, maybe not necessarily financially, but, and often that is the case, but also in just making the right connections to resources you might need. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've got a particular problem. You know, one thing to consider, the e-commerce platforms, including Shopify, they make sort of what 80% of the people need most of the time. That's what's core. Everything else is going to be some kind of add-on or customization that's specific to your needs. And that, that's sort of across the board. No one's made exactly your solution out of the box. Um, so those are things where you might need help. You might need to meet just the right person uh, uh, who understands that problem space. And the connectors like these organizations we've mentioned uh, can be really helpful, too. Thank you. Alex Lin, any services that you've used that you'd like to share? As services to develop the platform or sure. services within? Yes, for the rollout. Oh, OK. Uh, yes, well, I, um, I did use the, uh, the SEED uh, CAS program. I think it was Consultant Advisory Services, CAS. Is that the? I use the CAS program. They will give you um, up to $5,000. And I use that to uh, do the implementation uh, with the Able Sense. It was a kind of two, two uh, not implementation, the two phased uh, 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 rollout. One was the uh, e-commerce action plan, so I was able to tap into about uh, five thousand dollars from uh, the CAS program, which I think runs through ACOA, through Seed. Is that right? Uh, so they gave some money, and uh, we were able to uh, get basically um, an overview of what we needed to do, and kind of an evaluation of what would be necessary to actually create our e-commerce platform. Um, and then I went back to LearnSphere. Uh, they have their e-tools for export um, product. Uh, and they'll give you up to 65%, up to 15,000, is that right? Uh, for an e-commerce um, platform. So we uh, tapped into both of those programs um, to, uh, to develop our, our e-commerce platform for, for Bay Run. So great, great programs, really easy to use. I was going to use NSBI, uh, the um, BDP, but I got to Patrick, who's in the back over there, a little bit too late, <laughs> and they had just they had just run out of money like the week before. So, but he Patrick uh, told me about the the Learn Sphere, which I did not know about um, at the time, and I think it's a relatively new program. Um, but uh, they'll they'll help you to do uh, to do to do roll out e commerce. I think it does require uh, export um, for Learn Sphere, and I think because they get funding from ACOA, they mean export outside of Canada. So that could be uh, the only the only hindrance. Whereas I don't think the NSBI program requires it to be an export outside of Canada, but an export outside of Nova Scotia. That's right, so. and it's early in the year, so the business development program yeah. of, of NSBIs is alive and well. So yes, yes please do yeah. consider it. I was just I just missed it last it's year. It's a popular like, program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just 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 had missed it. But anyway, Patrick helped me out anyway, so it was good. Yeah. Anything you'd like to add, Lynn? I would just like to add that you should definitely seek out that assistance and support. Um, I just started to find out uh, uh, the breadth of uh, grants and, and support and workshops like this that are available mm -hmm. recently, um, having already launched Brew HQ and Noble Grapes been selling online for a few years now. Um, but I'm looking into, outside of even e-commerce, I'm looking into hiring mm -hmm. a work term students uh, for new positions, and there's there's grants for that training for staff, um, mm -hmm. hiring new people. When once you grow, there's 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 things available out there. Uh, don't look for them too late. Mm -hmm. That's, <laughs> That's good advice. Really good point. Dow has a master's of e-commerce program. I don't know mm -hmm. if anyone, and they do that. internships in. Uh, I think in the fall there's one coming up. Um, bright people who are focused on e-commerce, and you can probably get some assistance to hire them for, a, for an internship. So, so those are things that, living in Halifax, we're sort of spoiled by the, the university uh, ecosystem as well. Great. It's That's worth the great time tip. it takes yeah. to, <laughs> gonna totally use to that seek tip. that stuff out and, and fill out the forms. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about payment. Um, are you currently using the same payment methods online as you do in store? 
And what about things like cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin? How close are we to those technologies? We're not close. <laughs> You're accepting a lot of Bitcoin at Noble Group? Yeah. No Bitcoin. I, I, uh, I bought some <laughs> tickets to the Halifax Jazz Fest this morning, and I noticed at the bottom of it, of it that they accept Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. I was I'm, like, oh. I'm still sort of working in a space <laughs> coming yeah. from a team with a full out retail bricks and mortar background. Mm -hmm. And there's there's still things I have to convince them that are happening in the world that I think some of us probably take for granted that are happening. Like people don't want to order online and pick up in the store. Why would they do that? No, they do. No, they do. Um, yeah. So if I talk, started talking about Bitcoin, I'd be laughed out of the room right now. Yeah, uh. yeah I think the important thing with, with, with <laughs> cryptocurrencies, if you're, I mean, if, if it's a, Fun hobby kind of thing, you know. I mean, if you're if you're seriously able to throw your weight at that, good for you. We we don't go to the same parties probably because uh, it's an expensive thing to, to do to do at scale. But uh, if you're going to be spending Bitcoin, why not kind of immunize that and allow Bitcoin payment? If you, if you know you're buying other things with it, I think that would be probably a space where it makes some sense. And that's that's certainly possible. There there's. Uh, their transaction process will let you use cryptocurrencies as not just Bitcoin, as a, as a payment method. And it may unlock a certain marketplace for you of people who've got this. It's sort of like having PayPal on your website. It might reduce one more bit of friction where the person uses their PayPal wallet for everything. If you make it easy to pay, you know, maybe, that, maybe that's one thing that makes them finish the checkout. One little signal. So th there's aspects to that. Uh, what, I, what we're finding is the, the Google Wallet, Apple Pay is huge on mobile. And people will do anything on mobile you let them do. If you get out of the way and just make it work well, and that's why you know, if you're not doing mobile first responsive design, you're not really doing web design today. It's, it's, um, that, that's sort of table stakes. But the idea that you can thumbprint and not have to type out your billing and shipping address and all that every time to complete your purchase, that removing friction like that is really important. So I think it's important to uh, accept that. And then in store, contactless payment options are huge right now. We work with um, an Apple Cider company in Wolfville. If you haven't been there, they're really cool. Check them out. Um, when it's busy there, like during a grad week or something like that, they're processing a transaction every minute. So contactless pay was really important for them. And in their case, I think they're I want to tell tales out of school. I think they're using like Moneris as their in-store, but there's an integration with their Shopify, so they're able to get the benefits of debit and contactless in-store, <laughs> but also um, have that work out with their um, their online payment process. So essentially, they're doing like one bank rec for the two. So those kind of things are possible, but um, not required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you guys using something different in-store? Uh, we use Moneris in-store. Um, because that's what we've, they've always been using. Uh, we are working to get an integration between Moneris and Shopify, uh, which is possible. Um, and I mean, Moneris is, is great because we have a super low rate with them. So you you have to balance between frictionless for the customer and cost savings for you and, and make sure you build in the different percentage fees for the payment gateways when you're sort of figuring out uh, what your spends and, and bottom line costs are. Um, sure, I, PayPal's great, but it has one of the higher higher fees. Mm -hmm. So we want to push people to a, a place where our fees are lower, but we don't want to lose them either. So we don't make it unavailable, but you just have to make sure to get a balance between what's best for your company and what's best for your customer. Uh, I think for us, we have, because uh, we have a couple of different uh, sales channels that we run through Shopify. So we have our direct consumer, they just pay with credit card. Uh, we have our retail stores, they pay by credit card. But we also work with a lot of distributors. Uh, and in the pet industry, people are, you know, it's kind of like you're like literally herding cats. Like you're really like trying to get people to like move over into uh, a little bit uh, more efficient ways of doing things. Uh, but for our um, our distributor um, clients that we run through our Shopify platform, um, we just bill them outside of Shopify. So you can mark too. something paid, and then we just send them an invoice. invoice. So, yeah. uh, but we can keep track of all the all of the sales and everything in Shopify, which uh, makes it kind of seamless for us. Uh, the other thing that's kind of come up recently, which I've been talking to Jeff about, uh, we also have a sales agency that goes out uh, to meet with retail uh, customers and take the 
take orders and they'll usually go kind of with their pen and pad and like write an order. And I thought um, we also use the point of sales. We have like the little swipey thing for, for Shopify, like at uh, events and things like that. And I thought, well, maybe they could just take their phones, take the little Shopify swipe thing and then go to the store, and then as they're talking to the, to the merchant in the store, just take the order on the spot and have it go directly to Shopify instead of them taking the order, sending us an email, contacting us, so we upload it, and blah, 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 and then it takes like a day to get to the warehouse, like just be much more efficient. So we've been talking about um, getting, there is a bit of a, a workaround uh, through it, but I think this is one of the things that's kind of interesting is that each 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 uh, business has their own way that they're using it. So this is like the 80 and the 20. Yep. So we figured out, we were like, oh, we can send our, our sales team out. And if they have something on the spot, then they can just take the order immediately. And it'll just be much more quick. And I don't have to go back and ask for someone's last name or the credit card or like. And it reduces human error. It reduces mm -hmm. human error. Yes, exactly. Which is a huge cost savings to businesses. It is. And it if is. that customer is already in Shopify for some other reason, they're available on the device. Exactly. There. That's actually a pretty cool use case. We see it in trade shows a lot. So mm -hmm. you sell through, um, you can segment off some inventory, say we've got some inventory just for the show. But the customer records and the orders all still go through Shopify as if they were web store customers. Mm -hmm. And then with the point of sale app, which is just, it's just free with Shopify, you can do those B2B on site visits, build out an order, take it there, send it to the warehouse, and uh, accounting will invoice them with whatever your back office process is. Yeah. So those kind of things are nice because everything stays in the same system, and that's good for warehousing inventory and also just for your customer history. <clears throat> they go online, they reorder, they see all their orders they mm -hmm. made, even the ones that they did in store when you went to visit. So uh, those are little aspects of, of how you can have a platform that reduces friction and, and creates efficiencies for you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I'd like to just give each panelist a chance to say um, what you would want everyone in the room to know about e-commerce. We can start with whoever's ready. I'm ready. Okay. Go. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's something I've been sort of enveloped in in the last uh, couple months. Um, it's, it's, it's product information management, and it's, it's a side but very integral part of uh, your e-commerce strategy because um, you can get a website, you can have a warehouse, you can have all the things that you need to, to launch. But if you have a mess of data that's not easily searchable, um, that's named differently, it's not consistent in how things are, are presented or named, um, then your customers are gonna get there and not be able to find what they want. And it's tedious work that takes a lot of focus and brain power, but you need to make sure, whether you're selling 10 products or 1,000 products, that all the information, photos, titles, descriptions, price, weights, that you have all that information and that it's correct. Because if you put in wrong weights, then your shipping costs are gonna to be too low that you're charging and then you're gonna start losing money on shipping. If it's too high, your shipping costs are gonna to look too high and people aren't gonna continue through the checkout. If you call similar products by different names, or different in a different order, even in the title, it's it's going to create friction for your for your consumers. So, as one of your first steps should just be just like everyone says. Everyone here, if I said, do you have a list of all the products you sell? They would say yes, and I'd say get it for me. And then they go, oh well, there's this this list is this part over here, and then there's like a, well, there's the wholesale list, and then we have our a retail, and so. No, you don't yet have a list. <laughs> um, but if you if you want to be able to sell online and have all these things work automatically, you have to make sure that that data is is clean and ready to go, so that it feeds through your systems properly, so that you're not com coming up against things that are going to be an impediment to your to your launch and your growth. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, I was going to say you can almost definitely do it. There's a way that you can be successful with this. And it's kind of going kind to of piggyback on what Lynn's saying. So Lynn would have what I would call the big catalog problem. Um, Alex doesn't have that. It's a very small number of products. So you can, you can go at this different ways. Uh, there's different considerations that you're going to, you know, if you can get some, some uh, guidance from an implementation partner like, like my firm or others, uh, we, we may have worked with a client like Lynn and can warn you ahead of time, 
don't pick that launch date, your product information management isn't ready yet. These are the kinds of things that will come up and everyone's different, but you can almost definitely do it. We're seeing everybody from uh, mom and pop shops making wooden toys in Lunenburg to uh, people with big catalogs to some of, the, some of the largest brands in the world are all doing e-commerce. There's ways to get there. So if you're not doing it yet, or if you're on something that uh, you don't feel is effective for you, there's almost definitely a way to do it effectively. Thank you. Alex. Ooh, um, I love our e-commerce site. I find it so helpful. Uh, I actually don't even know how we would run our business without it uh, because of the, the tools, the analytics, the capability to look at all of our inventory and track the data. I actually don't know how we would do it. Also, the, the um, uh, tax um, um, planning, and uh, not planning, tax uh, calculations and things like that um, adds a dimension um, that we wouldn't be able to do with such a small team and is helpful from an accounting standpoint and a finance standpoint. Um, so it's, um, it's great. It does take a lot of work and there's a lot of different variables that uh, come up all the time or things that you don't realize that uh, you need to do in order to sell a, a product online, whether it's you know, getting your new UPC codes or registering your products uh, with GS1 so that you can actually sell a product online on Amazon or somewhere, somewhere else. I don't, I'm not sure if people are, are some. Yeah, there's, there's, there's all kinds of little small things that happen in the background that, uh, that you have no idea about that take a lot of time. Um, and then um, in terms of uh, just, um, uh, I was just going to add, um, w with, our, with our site, we're also um, going to be launching our, our U.S.-facing uh, site. Uh, so we'll be, have, we'll be able to uh, take customers directly from the U.S., um, and so that's something that's, uh, I think, really important for people to consider if they're, they're looking at um, doing stuff outside of, uh, outside of Canada. There's a lot of uh, capability through, the, through our, uh, our e-commerce platform that allows you to do that. So. Great, thank you. We do have a few minutes to take a couple of questions from the audience, if anybody has any that they'd like to ask. Yes. Um, with, uh, with your marketing, digital marketing, I know a couple of people in town that used to do mostly AdWords, and now they seem to be doing all uh, Facebook advertising. So I just maybe ask the panel to comment both on, you know, it seems to be a very low-cost way of, and also a good way to, uh, to segregate just the niche you're looking for. I have a, I have a great example of that is uh, Google AdWords was sort of the first, the, the first, pla the first platform to the mark that people could sort of dig in on their own and, and, and start doing. Um, doing di their own digital marketing. Um, on, on Google AdWords, if you're advertising something, say, that, like wine, they don't, they don't like that. And so that, uh, um, it costs a lot, you get a really low audience return if, you're, if you mention anything that's considered adult. And mm -hmm. even if you're really selling grape juice, if you say wine, you're, you're gonna have problems on Google AdWords. Whereas on Facebook, as long as you check over 19, you can talk about wine without any problems. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times, it really is dependent on your product and your audience. Like, if I'm selling wine to 35 to 50-year-old women, they're on Facebook, and I'm going to advertise to them there. I'm not going to advertise them on Google AdWords because it's hard to get my message through because of restrictions and because I know the, the audience of women are the majority on Facebook. So you really have to sort of analyze what platforms your audience use and make sure that those are the ones that you're on. It's not a catch-all, everyone uses Google. Well, yeah, everyone uses Google. But where do they really spend all of, like their online time? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? If they're a younger demographic who make beer are on Instagram, I've discovered, are, are women who want to make wine, they're on Facebook. Um, and then on Google, what, like I mentioned before, I'm just advertising my products on there now because I can advertise products, and if someone wants that product, they can type it in and, and see that product. Mm -hmm. So in terms of product, Google Shopping is the way to go for sure, but in terms of sort of getting engagement and, and finding where your audience is, spending their time, you want to be where they're spending their time. So you have to figure that out where they are. We're seeing a lot of uh, 
people with their own personal success story around Facebook ads or, or Google or influencer marketing is another thing that's that's really big and uh, Instagram and, and for a while there Pinterest and some other places where the content itself was essentially one click into a checkout those kinds of things are measurable and, and you can kind of create campaigns around them a thing that's really interesting that Shopify purchased a, a startup a couple of years ago called kit um, and kit is like a fake uh, AI virtual assistant that's a conversational interface. And Kit's first feature was, hey, you've added a product. Do you want me to buy an ad on Facebook for you? And it was generating the Facebook ad from the product description. Uh, you give it a budget, and it was just doing it for you. And you could even you know, press one to get a report, press two. So they're getting more natural language processing all in there. But what they found was there's huge traction in, in Facebook because people are spending their time, at least a lot of people are. Um, I would sort of hold that up as a reality. And the other reality is Google still owns search and organic. And beside organic is paid. And you shouldn't ignore it unless you know it's not working and not ROI there. So they're, you know, they're different uh, beasts. And people will give you their success and horror stories. And I think you get to find out what, what your story is going to be. Great. And if you want to add, Alex? No, I think that's, okay. that's pretty good. One more question? Hmm. Sure. How did you, uh, or what, where did you find statistics about uh, your, uh, you know, your target uh, market? Your, who is buying your product or mm -hmm. your product? How did you find those uh, information? Uh, well, uh, so for our product in particular, we, um, for at Bay Run, we're selling pet supplements. So um, you can do, there's a lot of industry publications and journals. Packaged Facts is a, a great um, uh, source you can use online for, for, for us where we're selling a retail product. So uh, we did a lot of information um, gathering that way. Um, I happen to know a lot about supplements and nutraceuticals kind of in general, so I had a, a good uh, sight on that. Um, AgriFood um, Canada, for us, uh, also has a lot of export-related information. So you can uh, look up uh, agri uh, Agriculture, AgriFood Canada, especially on trade statistics, uh, and they have all kinds of information about who's buying what product, where, and where it's going in the market, whether it's China or the U.S. or things like that. Uh, you can also... Um, talk uh, to folks at NSBI. They have a trade market intelligence service as well. Um, they actually did a, tr a TMI for us looking at the China, China market. Um, and so uh, they'll take a couple of weeks, uh, sit down with you, and, and do a full analysis on whatever your particular product or service is that you're, that you're looking for help with. Um, so that's, that's how we did ours. I was lucky to come into a business that had a 24-year history. So, and we also have suppliers who do that market analysis for us, our, our wine kit manufacturers, and sort of funnel that information down to us. And, and, and so we have a lot of support in that way. Um, but I think something that you have to also focus on or think about when you're defining who your target audience is, there, if you're an existing business, there is, this is my current audience. But aspirationally, what do you want that audience to grow to be as well? So there, it's, it's a little bit of a two-handed thing where you're like, this should be my target market or is my target market. But into the future, I want it to be able to um, expand into, because you want your audience not to grow out of, you want to keep the people you got, but still bring in new people. So just make sure not to focus too much on targeting to who you already have. You have to keep them happy, but make sure to also market to your aspirational target market as well. The only other thing I'll, I'll add on to that, the other thing that we also did after we did some of our own research and analysis was develop a, a user persona. So uh, cultivating an identity of a fake person or you know who we, who we imagine would be the kind of person based on the demographic information that we were pulling. Uh, so we had uh, women from the age of, uh, we had kind of two, women from the age of uh, 18 to 34 with a certain income level, urban, uh, you know, multiple in our cast, pet, pet owners, 80% of the market is to dogs, so we could kind of like come up with an idea of like who is the target person that we're identifying. Um, and then 
that helped us also as we were doing the engagement on the uh, social media marketing or digital marketing strategy, as well as also building the website in terms of the functionality and use, usability of the site, imagining who, are, who is the actual person who's going to use that. On the flip side, uh, also looking at, looking at uh, baby boomers and making it easy. So whether someone was looking at something on a mo uh, from, a, from a mobile perspective, um, so those were some of the kinds of things that we took into consideration when we were developing our e-commerce platform or site. Are, are you are you selling already? Do you already have customer data? Uh, no, I'm selling on Amazon. Okay. But, uh, I don't have no that. It is provide. No, I don't have no actually. Okay. That's my problem that I don't know what the age I should target. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so you're in an interesting. So I was going to say it depends how you're coming at it. If you've got a platform that's giving you billing and shipping information, it's almost definitely geographically segmenting for you, and that would that'll be emergent data. For some reason, we're really popular in the Midwest. Why is that? You know, you, that may that may be emergent. You didn't think that would be the case, and that will happen with other demographics that come with things like Google Analytics. If you're on your own platform, um, we've done things like uh, Google surveys to find out, and you can target those and, and to try to understand. If there's affinity for your product with well-designed survey, and you'd want to work with a perhaps a survey design expert on that, and we've also worked with uh, specialists in market research who will do web and phone panels. Uh, they'll call into a market, into a, a metro area or something, and get a sentiment analysis across competitors or brand awareness to let us know if you know is this a place that's perhaps good to do some more promotion in. And those are available, uh, and you can you can start small doing your own surveys and engage a, a market research firm as well. That's if you've got no data. If you've got it, all kinds of things are going to emerge from that data. Um, you, you will find out that you're you're just really popular with with a certain uh, subset of of uh, uh, enthusiasts about a particular thing who love your product or service for what they do, and you had never heard of them before. And you'll just start to see there's like an affinity group. So that's something to, to be aware of, that once you're collecting orders, you're going to start to see clumps that mean something. And uh, I guess you're coming at it from the side where you know it's, it's wide open right now. You don't have that data yet. And uh, market research is, is, a, is a way to do that. Is it too expensive for a Google survey, for example? Google surveys aren't, aren't expensive, but they're, they're lower quality typically than if you're, I mean, if you want to survey the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and ask them if they like your carbonated water, you can get that survey done. And it'll be very expensive. And you'll work with an expert survey panel company. But if you want to just do sort of a broad appeal across uh, the internet at large, you can usually get those kind of surveys quite affordably. Great, thank you. Thank you for the questions. They were excellent. And a special thank you to our panelists for joining us today. And giving us your time and your expertise. I hope everybody has something that they can take away with today and apply to their business. Um, I'd like to close by letting you know that we have another free workshop this afternoon right here in this room from 2.30 to 4. And it is entitled Harnessing Data Intelligence. What is your business desperately trying to tell you? We have a few seats left. You can uh, show up here at 2.15 and we would welcome you. And uh, thank you again for joining us and thanks to our panelists. Thank you.